Welcome to the Friday Night in a Space talk. And it's um, today's talk is Stop Playing Small, Stop Holding Yourself Back. And so I guess the question we start with is, do we find ourselves play, playing small in our life, in work, or even in our relationships? To quote Marianne Wilson, you're playing small doesn't serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. And I know perhaps my generation of people or slightly older would have been told, give your brother, give your sister space to shine. Don't hog the whole scene. Um, and it wasn't trying to make me small, but perhaps it had. So it's one of those things. So today we've asked our speakers specifically to share tools on how to stop getting in your own way, to own your own power, and to live a big life. Our speaker is Philippa Blackman. Philippa is an award-winning documentary filmmaker and a presenter for the BBC Radio 4 and BBC World Service. And that's included seven years as staff reporter and presenter for Women's Hour. Um, and that's just a tiny bit of what Ph Philippa actually does. And we were chatting the other day and she was telling me all the things she does do. And I had to stop and ask, how do you fit it all in? And so I guess that's what living your life fully is about. It means that there are no limitations you place on yourself. Philip is going to be sharing till 10 past seven, and then we'll do a guided meditation with her, just three minutes. And after that, she'll be taking your questions. So please send in your questions via the question and answer link or the chat, and I, it's my pleasure to be able to take your questions and put them to Philippa on your behalf. Philippa, thank you, over to you. Thank you so much, Arti, and I shall look forward uh, to your questions later on in our, our session today. Um, so, very interesting topic, and I, I have to say thank you to Arti for... Um, Philippa? That's it. Sorry, yes. we've had a few problems with the internet. Apologies. Over to you. That's all right. No problem. I'm here. Thank you so much, Arti. Um, yeah, I was um, thanking Arti in a way for having come up with this topic. Um, it happens that you sometimes are given a topic and you think, gosh, there's nothing I can think of to say on this topic. And then the more you think about it, um, the more you realise that actually it is something that um, has got significance and resonance. And it's very much been the case with this topic um, of playing small. And if I look back over my life journey, I can see that in many ways, that has been one of the defining features that I have been exploring um, the edge of. Um, so Arati was talking about her childhood experience of not wanting to outshine her, her brothers and, and sisters. And I was thinking about where this message for playing small actually comes from. And I think for some of us, it does come from the home that we grew up in. Um, I had a sister who was two and a half years older than me, um, who was very sensitive. She used to love writing poetry. She was a dreamer. Um, she, she just sort of floated through life. Um, whereas I was very, um, you know, loud, exhibitionist, um, slightly, um, you know, first to everything. And my mother used to tell me to kind of play small because it would squash my sister's feelings. So if I did really well in an exam, um, at school, she would say, don't mention it at the dinner table, because it might, um, you know, might upset your sister. And I remember one time I won a, a lovely silver trophy for acting. And I really wanted to put it on the mantelpiece to say, look, I've won this. 
And she said, no, just keep it in one of your drawers in your bedroom because we don't want to, you know, upset the apple cart um, with your sisters. So, so this message of playing small to protect other people, I think for some of us, it does begin in childhood. And it is quite um, a British thing in many ways. We don't necessarily shout our achievements from the rooftop. Um, we kind of like, it was nothing, anyone else would have done the same, um, it's not a big deal, um, and, and we sort of play them down. Whereas you could say the, the American way is very much celebrating achievements, celebrating greatness and, and wanting to, to advertise that. So I think there's a cultural tendency towards um, playing small as well. Uh, we don't appreciate people with the, the big ego, the big I am. And so we're very much not wanting to come across like that. Um, and so we have this small, playing small voice that is, is in the back of our, our, our mind um, and commenting on things that we do. So what is the reason for playing small? Why, why do we do it? Who gets to benefit from that? And I've been thinking about it during the course of the day and I've, I've written quite a few notes. Um, so forgive me if I refer to my notes from time to time. Um, but there are some interesting issues that come out of, of this thought. Um, and I'd like to begin with the quote that Artie started with, and I think she put it on the flyer for the event as well, which is a quote from Marianne Williamson, who um, at one time ran for president of the United States of America, which tells you something about her ability to think big uh, rather than play small. Um, she's also been spiritual advisor to people like Oprah Winfrey. So she's really gone out there on the big stages and, and claimed her power. And she wrote the, the piece that Artie has quoted um, for this event tonight. And I'd like to read it in its full because it is actually really poignant. And, and is a nice place for us to begin. So this is what Marianne Williams says. Um, she's called it our greatest fear. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is not our light, but our darkness that frightens us most. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is around us. It's not just in some of us, it's in all of us. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. So that touched me deeply when I read that, that we almost have this fear of our own greatness. Of, of what it would look like, of how it would change me, of how it would potentially change my relationships, change my situation. And so we shy away from it. We maybe hear the calling, the whispering of that small voice within us to do something great. And we take a step back from it because our fears keep us in a place of comfort, 
a place of security, a place of um, feeling that we're not going to be upsetting other people. We're not going to be outshining other people. And yet really, who's benefiting from that? If we break that down a little bit, and if I think about my own life and the times that I have maybe played small, and by the way, it was Marianne Williamson who first used this expression of playing small. I mentioned the situation with my older sister and the importance of me playing small so that I didn't outshine or squash her feelings. But if each one of us looks at our own lives, what are the ways in which we play small? And what are the drivers of us choosing to do that? Many of us in relationships will find ourselves in situations where we play small in order to maintain the relationship. Who, which partner wants to feel that, you know, that they're being outshone, that they're being outmaneuvered. And so we play small, we keep ourselves within a certain framework. I know that I have done that within relationships that I've been in. Or possibly we have children and we don't want to challenge our partner in any way that means the relationship might be jeopardized and the family might break up. So we choose to maintain the status quo. We choose to go along with um, what is gonna be least disruptive. We do the thing that is little and good to keep the other one happy. In some situations, women can have a job or a man can have a job at work where they are playing with all their strengths and their, their, their powers. In that environment, they're not playing small, but in another environment, maybe they are. Maybe in relation to the board of directors, you play small. In relation to the trustees, you, pe you play small. Um, so it's not that it's the whole of our life we're perhaps playing small, but certainly there will be an area in, well, not certainly, but possibly an area in which we are. And when we analyze it, it's our fears that hold us back from stepping into our power, from stepping into our truth of who we are and what we feel. There may be situations where you're with people who say something that you don't agree with and you choose not to speak out, to not stand in your power because you don't want to fall out of favor with that group. You don't want those friends to see you as different. And so you keep quiet. You, you don't um, articulate your own truth. And so we can look at this as the small self and the big self. So the small self we could see in terms of the personality self. So the ego self, that part of me that is invested in what other people think about me. Because I have a belief that without them thinking positively about me, it may jeopardize my position. It may mean I lose my job. It may mean I lose my family. Uh, it may mean I lose security of, of one form or another. Uh, and so my anxiety will keep me small. But that is on the level of the personality. Shift then to the big self, to, to playing big. And there's a jump there from the personality, the small self, to the big self, the what we could call the soul self, that part of me which is magnificent, which knows there is potential for greatness, that feels expanded, that feels unlimited. And why should I not be that version of myself? Who gets to benefit from me playing small? It's certainly not me.
in the long run. In the short term, yes, it may feel like that's a good option because you get to keep the status quo, you get to not rock the boat, you get to keep things as they are. But what is that doing to your true self, your true inner self? At some level, you know that you are shortchanging yourself because you're not expanding into the fullness of your own potential. And so we have, for some people, a whole lifetime of perpetuating this small self thinking, this personality driven consciousness that is too frightened to step outside the norm and do something that might be completely unorthodox, but it's true to who you are. And so you work hard at school, you pass your exams, you maybe do a university education, um, you get a good job, you get a good relationship, you have your, your children, you pay into your pension fund, you're doing all the right things. And people in society are saying, no, she's really good. She's, she's doing everything right. And yet somewhere inside you, there's this voice that's saying, yeah, but that's not really me. That's not really who I am. So you're playing small to yourself. And it's through taking moments of stillness and silence and journeying inward and asking yourself, does this really feel me? Or am I actually giving away my power to a person or a situation or could be something like maintaining a, an impressive house? Um, am I giving away my power in order to maintain those things at my own cost? at the cost of my own true being? Or do I make a change? Do I say, regardless of the consequences, I'm going to be true to myself. I'm not going to play little anymore. I'm going to be true to my soul self, my big self. And life can throw situations that nudge you along the way, that challenge your cozy, comfortable, secure world that you've created for yourself, that you will do anything to keep in because you're fearful of what will happen in the big bad world outside. And so you just stay in that place of fear. But sometimes situations come that jolt us out of that. And we possibly turn our head the other way and pretend that we haven't had that idea or pretend that we don't really want that because change can be challenging. There's a saying that when you begin on the road of change, the burning ground rises up to meet you. In other words, so many challenges will be put in your way that will, will question your determination to make this change. I remember a situation when I was um, a mum at home and as much as that was wonderful and I was still working and doing things, but I wasn't fulfilling my true potential. And um, I decided I wanted to do a training to become an interfaith minister. Um, I was wanting to create another way of earning money that could work better. Um, with having children because my work at the BBC was all consuming it was like being married to your job and I'd taken time out um, to adopt these two children and um, I was beginning to lose myself and I articulated this to my partner that I wanted to do the course and of course, there was no benefit for him in that. It just meant I was going to be away for weekends on my training course. I was not going to have as much time to devote to the business because I was a partner in the business. And, you know, he would not necessarily put obstacles, but try and stop me from doing this thing. And yet I knew I had to do it. I knew there was a part of me that had to uh, grow and expand into this 
this bigger soul part of myself. And I really relate to that sense of the burning ground because I had to walk across hot coals with my determination that this was something I had to do to fulfill who I really was and that other people could, um, could cooperate and support me in doing that. And I found that the clearer I was that this was something I wanted to do, the more the resistance just fell away. And in the end, what happened was that by me spending more time uh, training and being away at weekends meant that um, their dad had much more quality time with the children and they developed a much closer relationship and you know, good came out of it for everybody. The kids learned to manage without me. Um, everything was great. And yet it would have been so easy to have said, no, it's fine. I'll stay at home. I'll stay doing the whole, you know, looking after small children thing. And, you know, that's fine. And so that for me is a time in my life when I really think that this having a few moments of discomfort, few moments of feeling the resistance to do something that feels like you're being true to a higher calling, the calling of that bigger part of yourself, that by going through that little bit of discomfort, the place I arrived at on the other side was so much greater, was so much more expanded and led to so many uh, amazing opportunities that would never have happened had I not had that courage. And it's amazing, I've seen so many times how women, and I keep talking about women because as we discussed earlier, that is my, my, my frame of thinking is always from the point of view of, of women because that's where my work has been. But women who in their professional lives are really high up, holding positions of great responsibility in charge of a great team and yet you see them in another setting, usually in their domestic setting, and they just give their power away. They become meek and submissive and do whatever is needed to fit in and don't put their own needs in the picture. And they become different people because of fear. So in learning to commit to that bigger self, we're committing, um, to our own life, we're committing to our own truth, we're committing to the experience that we most want in our life, which is to feel free, to feel alive, to feel that potential has really been expressed, to be loved, and to have peace of mind. Because by playing small, there can be no peace of mind really. There can be temporary comfort, temporary easing of anxiety, but the mind is not going to be peaceful because deep down you will know that you have sold yourself short, that you have accepted some kind of compromise. And the vision that you commit to, it doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to wait for the perfect situation to come along. You just have to commit to the next step. And then having made that step, then the path after that will become clear and you can take the next path. Because without a vision of change, you will stay with the status quo. And years and decades can pass and, and nothing has changed. And you can remain in a place of feeling dissatisfied. So we talk about playing small to ourselves as well. And I think there's an element for many women in our lives that, that we believe that life has to be a struggle, that if something is worth having, it's worth making sacrifices for, it's worth putting your everything into to the point where you're exhausted, depleted, have no energy, put other people's needs first. 
And this is something that my dad used to refer to as the white knuckle ride. So imagine you're on the Big Dipper and you're gripping the bar in front of you as you're going up one minute, down the next, and your, your knuckles are turning white because you're holding on so fast because it's such a, a, a fast and terrifying ride. And we very often go through life with this mentality of the white knuckle ride that we are rushing from here to there, um, believing that unless we are exhausting ourselves in the process, then it's not really making full effort. And so in a way we play small to this belief of, of life having to be so intense that there is no time for stillness, no time for reflection and allowing that voice within to arise within. We just keep going, we keep going. Some people see it as being similar to, um, you know, the, the animal that runs all day uh, in order to find its prey and, 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 and eat. And there's some part of us that believes that unless we're doing that, we haven't really achieved anything. But why play small to that belief of how the world should be? Why not say to that belief, enough? I don't have to kill myself on the altar of achieving these things that society thinks uh, are going to make me into a credible person. What do I do that means, A, I can stop, B, I can hear that voice within, C, I can find the strength to start moving towards this other vision of myself, where there is time for self-compassion, self-nurture, that I can redefine my goals and objectives in a way that will really truly give me what it is I want, rather than satisfying other people's expectations of me. So we try to not outrun our challenges, but stand, face them and change them. We also have this notion of keeping going because the reward will be at some point in the future. Never mind if I'm not really happy in the present moment, because my happiness will come in the future when I, whatever, dot, 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 when I find that perfect job, when I'm living in that gorgeous house, when I reach retirement and I can then have time to do what it is I really do. And so we, we keep ourselves going, climbing up the ladder that um, we have set ourselves as a challenge, um, but deep down feeling that that isn't necessarily what is making me happy. Happiness isn't something that comes at the end of a lifetime of struggle. Peace of mind is not something that comes when you retire and devote yourself to the scriptures and contemplating the eternal truths. Bliss is not a state of consciousness simply for the, the yogis of India. These states of being, these qualities of being should be things that are part of my life here and now, part of my life in this every day. They're my birthright. It's how human beings should be in a natural state of flourishing. So why should I play small and accept that life is the struggle? that life isn't necessarily going to bring me happiness, bring me peace. If there is something within me that is wanting those experiences, why delay, why put it off? There's a, a saying by the psychologist Abraham Maslow, um, that he called the Jonah complex, um, which is where Jonah clung to that which was going to bring benefit to himself rather than to anyone else. 
Um, and, and this is what he said, the evasion of one's growth, the setting of low levels of aspiration, the fear of doing what one is capable of, this voluntary self crippling, this pseudo stupidity, all mock humanity. The path that feels safe is probably not the path that is right for you. And so this playing big as opposed to playing small touches on a bigger part of myself, a part that sees the connection between all things, that sees the relationship with all things, that recognizes that we all have shared visions, common goals, that if we can work together, we can make a difference, not just to the world around us, but in so doing to our own lives. And so the opposite of the Jonah complex is to somehow rise above this limited thinking of only doing that which is going to bring benefit to me and possibly by extension to my immediate family, to looking at the bigger picture and seeing what do we collectively as humanity need right now? What can I as an individual do to take a step towards achieving that? And so we expand into a fuller vision not just for ourselves, but for all of humanity. And this is where we come back to Marianne Williamson's quote, that it's not our inadequacies that we are fearful of. It's actually our power, our potential for greatness. And all those reasons that we've given ourselves for why we can't achieve that greatness fall away. We maybe say to ourselves, I'm too busy at work. Got too much going on. Can't, can't go there right now. I don't have time. I don't have the money. I don't have the talent. I don't have the skills. When you start stepping into your greatness, you have to let go of those self-limiting ideas and beliefs about yourself. You have to be prepared to completely change not only how you see yourself, but how you operate in the world and how other people are maybe going to see you. They may like it, they may not. That is of little interest because what you're moving towards is an expression of your own authenticity, an expression of your own power, of your own greatness. And this for me is one of the really fascinating parts of being on this journey of self-discovery that I, that I would say I'm on at the moment and have been for many years, is that it challenges me to be the best version of who I can be. It's almost like reprogramming those self-limiting beliefs with a completely new vision, not just of myself, but a new vision of all of humanity, of what we are capable of achieving between us, of the greatness of who we are as human beings. I think many of us are filled with so much despair when we look around us at what we're doing to the planet, of um, what we're doing to each other, of how we're putting profit above the planet. Um, we're putting, um, you know, the bottom line above people's lives. And we feel shameful that we're part of a species that is doing that to ourselves and doing that to the planet. But we're living through a very distinct period of time, which is the worst of times and that all those things are happening, but also the best of times. 
and that there is this real flowering of the human spirit where people are realizing what potential they have to be something great, something that can make a difference. And I think this young generation coming through have a sense of what they can achieve by cooperating and by standing firm to a vision of the world that will ensure it is a better place for all of us. And so how best do I serve that vision? Is it by being small, by being little and good, doing the things which will tick the boxes and give me limited respect and recognition from other people? Or is it by sitting in silence and listening to that calling from deep within to a greater task, a task that will take me on a journey that will mean I have to step outside completely of myself and what I thought I was. And so opportunities come that enable you to, to challenge yourself and to step into greatness, to see yourself as, as a being that has the potential, not just for greatness, but for, for divine qualities that you can call from deep within you the beautiful spiritual qualities that will make you into the best human being that you can possibly be. So let me finish with just reading again the, the Marianne Williamson quote and just see how that is sitting with you now. Um, because the seeds of change are within us. They're, they are within each of us. We are all of us on a journey, whether we accept it and acknowledge it. We are on a journey at this point in time, a change, a transformation from one way of being to another way of being. Just like the journey of the, the caterpillar that eats its way through the day, munching as many leaves as it can find, consuming, consuming, consuming which is what we as humanity have been doing. And then comes this period of stillness where the caterpillar turns into itself and spins a little cocoon within which the, the cells begin to disintegrate and become all liquid and mushy. And then from that soup of mushiness comes the first cells that will form the body of the caterpillar and these are called the imaginal cells they hold the vision of the future way of being which is that of a caterpillar and very interestingly what happens in biology is that the original caterpillar cells try and attack these newly forming imaginal cells they try and overwhelm them and destroy them but the imaginal cells survive by clustering together with other imaginal cells and they give strength to each other. And slowly the imaginal cells grow in number and overpower the, the, the caterpillar cells, sorry, the butterfly cells grow in number and overpower the caterpillar cells to the point where a new butterfly body is created and eventually it splits out from the cocoon and flies and becomes the beautiful butterfly that it was always destined to be. And we are going through that same process right now where we can move into this completely transformed and expanded way of um, seeing ourselves and, and our consciousness. So believe in the butterfly that is you. Give thanks for the caterpillar. Give thanks for the cocoon that nurtured that vision of a new you, but with the determination for change 
allow those new visions, those new imaginal cells to grow and expand. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is all around us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. So let's just sit with that for a few moments and let that sink in. So just taking a few deep breaths. Feel yourself arriving in a place of stillness, deep within. A place of knowing. A place that feels true to the real you. Taking this time I feel a sense of purpose. A new vision for a new me. A new vision of a better world that I can be a part of creating. What is my own task within this incredible journey? What is mine to do? In what way am I being called to achieve the greatness of my own potential? without fear, without ego, without taking anything away from anyone else. I step into that power. I step into the brilliance of that shining light. And I know that the more I can become that light, the more I can shine that light out into the world. And so be it.
Thank you, Philippa. That was really beautiful meditation. The questions have been coming in a constant flow. And so I'm going to start with the first one, is, which was somebody asking, how on earth do you fit everything into a day? <laughs> all your different activities. How do you fit it all in? And by the look of it, you do not stress. There's no stress lines on your face. So how do you do that without feeling that stress? Mm -hmm. So it does feel like a bit of a dance, if I'm honest. Um, I live next door to my 87-year-old mother who's getting more dependent and needs more looking after to teenagers. They're now both teenagers who are both demanding. Partner with whom I run a business who's always got demands and things that he wants me to be doing to be supporting our business ventures. But I suppose within all of those things, the voice that calls the loudest is the voice of my own service to the world, my, my, my passion for doing what it is it feels I'm here to be doing. And that gives energy. And I think when you're doing that which it is you're really meant to be doing, if you think about it in your life, when you've really been passionate about something, achieving something, do you notice how tired you feel? Do you try and procrastinate? Do you find yourself wandering off in different directions? No, you stay completely focused and you, um, you give yourself and all your energy to that which feels most important to you. So those other things kind of get done. But what gives me the energy is knowing that I am on task with doing exactly that which I'm meant to be doing at this time. So I'm a real believer in writing. I don't call them to-do lists, they're can-do lists. Um, so, you know, I keep track of all these different things that are going on with lots of, of lists, but there's no stress around whether they've happened or how they've happened. I know they will happen in their right time. Ultimately, everything will work out and even it's like that saying from the Marigold Hotel, um, everything will be all right in the end. And if it's not all right, then it's not the end. Um, so, you know, it will be all right. Uh, and so why be stressed? Everything is fine. Thank you. Um, the next person is sharing and would like some suggestions. I feel, I feel small in comparison to others. I feel that people have more than me. I know I should focus on me and not others. Would I'd like to stop comparing myself to others and feeling insecure. So do you have any suggestions on how to stop comparing yourself and dealing with that insecurity that comes from that? So what's coming into my mind is something that one of my teachers used to talk about, um, Daddy Janki. She used to say, you know, look at the fingers, look at the fingers on your hand. You know, they're all very different. If the little finger compared itself to the big finger, it could feel small. It could feel like it hasn't got the importance of the big finger. Or the thumb could look at itself and say, well, all those guys are all together. They all seem to be, you know, nicely harmonizing with each other I'm stuck out here all on my own down here feels a bit lonely um, the pointing finger might say well you know why do I have to be the one that's always pointing the ring finger might say why do I always have to wear the ring you know each of the fingers could come up with a reason why they weren't as good as the other fingers and yet the beauty of the fingers is that each one has its own part to play and without any one of those fingers, it would become so much harder um, for the hands to be used in doing whatever task. And so really, there's no point in comparing yourself with anyone else, because they have their own storyline, they have their own role, they have their own part, and you have your own unique part. And can you say that any one of the fingers are less crucial than any of the others? They're all needed. And so just be the best of the fingers that you are. Be the best thumb, 
that you can be, be the best um, pointing finger that you can be and know that it might look from the outside as if someone is taller, greater, bigger, more important, but actually it's the unity of all the fingers together that is really important. Thank you, nice image. Um, the next person is saying, hi, I tried getting a job within TV and I was expected to play small, fetch coffee, be, do be talked down to until one day. And that's just how the industry works. Was this your experience and would you do it again or advise anyone else to do that mm -hmm. um, with the mindset to not accept that? Mm -hmm. And that's a lovely question. And I know exactly what you mean. Um, we used to have an unofficial vetting scheme for new people that wanted to come and work with us. And there was a certain type of person who came in wanting to instantly be doing something that was really, you know, high status, high profile, um, you know, getting all the attention. And we kind of didn't feel we had room for people like that in our team because there's no room for prima donnas. Everyone has to be prepared to muck in and do everything. Um, and so it was, as you're exactly saying, it was the people who, you know, never mind, they'd got a master's degree from Cambridge. They were happy to go and make the tea. They were happy to fill out whatever form that needed doing. They were all rounders. They were happy to pitch in. Uh, and so they were nice to have as part of the team. So they made it onto the team. But having said that, I did also observe that having got through that initial process, there were people who, who simply believed in their own greatness. And very often it had nothing to do with their actual ability, had nothing to do with how good they really were, what they were good at was in backing themselves, in believing in themselves and in believing that they would succeed. And I saw this time and again, how people would come in who were at the beginning quite a bit junior to me, but they just had this huge self-belief that would not accept anything small, believed only in their greatness, and it's like others around them started to believe in their greatness too. And they would put themselves forward to do things which they weren't necessarily even ready to do. And I've got a few people like that I can think of who have gone on to become, you know, big commissioning editors of, of big TV channels. And so their greatness, their belief in their own greatness took them a long way. So it's a balance of, of both in certain situations Yes, you do need to, to play small to show that you are a team player, to show that you're prepared to do whatever it takes for the whole team to succeed. But at the same time, you need to never give up on believing in your own greatness and believing in what it is you can achieve, because nothing breeds success more than the belief of success. And people want to be around that energy of success and it brings success. Mm. Sounds like there has to be enough self-respect and respect for others. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be in balance, not one heavy, so to speak. Totally. Wow. Okay, the next person is sharing and then they have a question. As a professional black woman, it has sometimes been necessary to play small not because of my own fear, but because of the unfounded fear or insecurities of others. You may want to comment on that in a moment. But the question she has is, is there something to be said for displaying modesty and humility at appropriate moments in an act of empathy towards others? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think it's an, an important distinction. Um, Self-respect um, and humility are both qualities um, which are needed 
but flagrant displays of ego are perhaps not so welcomed. So you need to have different tools in your toolkit that you can bring out at different moments. And, you know, there may be situations that you decide require you to, to play small in that moment. And I think as long as you're aware of the fact that you are playing small and aware of your reasoning as to why you're doing that, and that that doesn't become a way of operating um, that goes that goes on, then, you know, there is a time and a place. Um, but, you know, to play small because someone is being sexist or someone is being racist, um, can you condone those behaviours? Not, not really. Um, I think you need to find a way to stand in your own power in relation to those attitudes and come from a place of deep respect, but of standing your own truth. We do have this line of conditioning that says, you know, only speak when you're spoken to, don't answer back, um, you know, don't speak out of turn, all these sayings that we're brought up with um, to become, you know, sociable, socialized people. But actually, you know, there is a time and a place and the wisdom is in knowing which of those to use at what time and to have conscious awareness around the fact that you're doing it for a limited time period for a specific reason. But then you have your red lines beyond which you won't go. And regardless of the outcome, you have to stand in your truth and you have to express your truth um, and not play small in that moment. So it's a toolkit and you as the craftsman have to know which tool to use uh, in which moment and how forcefully to use that tool. Thank you. The next question is, how would one know whether they're limiting themselves or being realistic? Maybe I'm not cut out for this dream. Maybe it's not the time. How can I tell? so that I neither take action, sorry, so that I either take action or wait or change my focus onto what I can really do. I like this idea of waiting. And I think sometimes there is a place for waiting because perhaps it's not the right time. But I would say that on the whole, if a vision has come to you, if a dream has landed in your lap, if a thought has come in your mind, then that means that it is yours to do. And which of us started out on the journey towards fulfilling our dreams, knowing at the outset that we had all the skills necessary to achieve that dream? Hardly any of us. We begin on that journey with perhaps just one tool in our toolbox, but we use that tool well. And in using that tool, we then acquire the skill to use another tool. And then that whole momentum gathers pace and energy. And before you know it, you've got all the skills you need at your disposal. So I would say never think that you don't have the skill or the talent. If you didn't, then you wouldn't have the thought or the desire to do that thing. If the dream has come to you, it's your dream to dream. And it might not be fulfilled in the way that you originally thought, but there will be something in that that um, will, will manifest in some way. There's that saying, shoot for the moon, because even if you don't reach the moon, you'll still be amongst the stars. You know, our dream will take us to a place that we could never get to if we didn't have the courage to follow that dream. The worst of all worlds, I think, would be to turn your gaze away and, and not look that dream in the eye, to pretend you hadn't seen it, to pretend you hadn't had that thought, because that is to live a life of compromise and temporary um, comfort and security. And that ultimately will not bring you happiness and it won't bring you peace and it won't bring you self-fulfillment so have that dream follow that dream and you just never know where it will take you 
Philippa, there's so many questions that are still outstanding, but I'm going to finish with just a couple here um, because they seem to carry the essence of um, all the others. So um, when do you know you are not coming from a space of ego? How do you stay true to yourself? And what steps would you take to move forward to being true to yourself? Ego has been a companion on my life journey from the start. I talked about enjoying the exhibitionism of being a little toddler in my drama group. And to an extent, you know, we, we all have a need for ego. If we didn't have any ego, then we wouldn't eat or protect ourselves or provide shelter for ourselves. There would be no sense of self. So we need, we need an ego, but we need for it to be a healthy ego, one that's in balance. I think the telltale signs of when the ego is overstepping its mark is when you care too much about what others are thinking about you. Um, you begin to care too much about how you're looking and what other people think about how you're looking. Um, you become identified with the story that you're putting out there about yourself. So when people criticize, you feel a little prick of conch, little prick of hurt inside, you know, how, why did they say that about me? How dare they say that about me? It's not true what they said about me. That's the ego getting a little knock, a little dent, because you're invested in what other people think of you. So to journey to a place where your ego is not the driver, you, you, it's not that you don't care about what other people think about you, it's just that you're not invested in that. Some people will think this, some people will think the other. You're certainly not going to go out and seek their um, affirmation of what they think of you because you have the knowledge that you're on track with your own path, with your own journey. And your validation is coming from yourself and it's coming from your connection to um, whatever greater power uh, you're drawing on, whatever that may be. You don't need the validation from others. And so people can say, do, think, whatever they want, uh, and you're going to be stable in your own um, belief that you are in the right place for you at that time. Um, so I think it's when when the ego gets pricked by other people's comments that you know too much of yourself is invested in what other people are thinking of you. And how do you know when you're being true to yourself and what steps can you take towards mm -hmm. that? I think the answer to that is very simple. You experience happiness. You experience joy. You experience an expansion in your heart. It's a very easy test. In any situation in life, am I feeling happy? Is there a sense of burden, of pressure, of fulfilling expectation, of doing something I don't really want to be doing, but others are asked me and I don't want to let them down? You know, this whole weaving of a trap that goes on in, in our lives that can become our lives. At the end of that, you don't feel happy. You don't feel light. You feel burdened. You feel tired you feel like you need to take a break. When you're on track, you feel natural happiness. You feel that you love your life. You welcome all parts of your life, even those that are challenging because they're enabling you to grow. You have energy. You wake up with a sense of, fantastic, another day, I get to have another day to do these things that I, I love doing. So happiness, are you happy? Are you feeling peace, contentment? Are you feeling joy? And that is your sign that you're on the right path for you. 
Thank you. And the final question this evening. Um, thank you for reminding me of my younger self. Um, but then life had trodden on it. My question is, did you have to leave your husband, family, friends, perhaps behind to be your new self? Mm -hmm. So this is, a, this is a great question. Um, I sort of touched on it earlier when I talked about doing my interface training and I worried that that would upset the apple cart but found that actually everyone in the family dynamic got to um, benefit from me being clear about what it was I wanted to do. Sometimes it can mean that things fall away. <clears throat> it's a bit like a rocket taking off into the sky. There comes a point where parts of that rocket just fall away because they're not actually serving um, the, the, the rocket in reaching its goal, reaching its destination. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen a film, Educating Rita, but it's about a film, uh, a film about a woman from quite a sort of uh, a working class background, no money at all, a husband that wanted her at home with dinner on the table at a certain time, and she was very much downtrodden. And she began doing um, uh, a degree course and discovering that she had this most fantastic intellect. And she was the professor's favorite student. And she went on to achieve greatness. And on that journey of greatness, her partner recognized that she was no longer the right partner for him and he was no longer the right partner for her. And they agreed to part. And so the commitment to yourself, the commitment to your life, has to be a total commitment. And you can hold an open heart that those who are on the journey with you will come with you on that journey. But if you reach a point where they feel they can't support you in that, then you have a choice to make. Do you choose the short-term comfort and security of staying within your limitations? Or do you choose to step out and trust that life will support you? Trust that there is a way forwards for you whilst being true to yourself. And yes, there may be challenges, but if that feels totally clear and right for you, it will also be right for the other people in that dynamic as well. Um, there's, I could talk for another hour about that, but that's probably as long an answer as, as we have got time for. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philippa. Um, let me make my announcements and then we'll go from there. So the first thing I'd like to share with you is the product we think you would enjoy. Um, it's Dare to Live and the author is Miriam Subarina. She's from Spain. Um, and it's one of our most popular books. It's one of those books that people read for themselves, really enjoy, and then come back and get another one for a friend or somebody in their family. So it's someone I can recommend very comfortably. It explores how to live without fear um, and live with your whole heart. So um, Miriam in the book shares how life, and I can't read everything, sorry how life is not always as you would like it to be, but it is in your hands to make your mindset stronger than the circumstances that you're facing. So the book is $9.99 plus post and package if you would like to have it sent to you. If you would like it sent to you, drop us an email at info at innerspace.org.uk and we'll send you a link to be able to pay for it and send us your details so we can send it to you in the post. Alternatively, and this is the bit I love to share, come and um, visit the inner space. You'll be able to browse through the bookshop, pick up the book itself, as well as use the quiet room. And it was just the other day, it struck me that the quiet room has been a space to meditate in and only meditating 
for close to 30 years. And so if you're looking for a space just to quieten your mind, to deepen your faith in yourself or explore that thought that's inspiring you, it's a great space to come and use. Um, so yes, come and visit us. And even when you're browsing through the bookshop or using the quiet room, you can attend the in-person meditations at lunch times or in the evening um, at the end of your workday or participate in seminars on Thursday and Saturday. And we will be running um, Improve Your Self-Esteem seminar this coming weekend. But there's other seminars upcoming. So there's Overcoming Self-Limiting Beliefs. There's People Skills. And just check the website and see which ones you want to attend. There's also the online sessions. So on next Friday, we have How to Tran the How of Transformation, Making Change Happen. And that's on Friday, the 27th of May. And our speaker, Carolyn, will be joining us from Germany. There's the uh, online seminar, How to Meditate on Tuesday, the 24th. And there are the daily guided meditations, Monday to Sunday at one o'clock to help you refresh and recharge all the morning meditations. Um, that are there to set a positive tone to your day. And those are during the weekdays. For all events, please do register via the website. And finally, we're going to ask you to pay it forward. We'd really love your help with getting the word out, telling a friend, a family member, a colleague, telling someone in your community about the events so that you can share the benefits with those people you know, you love, um, and you respect in your community. So please do help us by getting the word out there. And that only leaves me to say, Philippa, thank you so much for sharing tonight. I really love that we don't have to put off our peace, our happiness uh, to some distant date and time. It's something we can experience today if we choose to stop playing. Thank you so much, Arti, for the invitation. And thanks to everyone. Uh, you've made it through to Friday evening and you chose to spend it with us. So we feel deeply honoured. And I really look forward to being with you again, hopefully before too long. And good night to everyone um, who's joined us this evening. And we look forward to welcoming you back online or in person.